Hi, good afternoon. This is Rachel Dixon and Sarah McDougall, uh, co-curators of the Outpour exhibition at Benoit Gallery. We've been really delighted to receive various questions from you and we will endeavour to answer them in this next uh, short snippet. I think what's been particularly of interest to us that a lot of the questions, although they are phrased slightly differently, in essence tackle the same issues um, and primarily this is to do with how we conceived of the exhibition, how we chose particular works and what works we excluded, whether there were any particular reasons for doing so. Um, so we'll try and address that in a very kind of informal way before moving on to a couple more specific questions. Okay, so uh, one of the main criteria for us was to cover lots of the different artistic groups who intersected during this introduction of British modernism. Um, we wanted to cover some of the uproars, Rachel, so he hence we went with that title. And we were able, through that title, to look at both the press coverage of the shows, particularly in the early years, um, controversies around particular paintings, and sort of internecine artistic warfare between different movements or sometimes personalities. So the press uh, criticism, I would say, was absolutely a kind of key resource for us uh, when we were starting to research. Uh, we worked very much with London Group catalogues, which gave us an invaluable database. We could then see every work that was exhibited um, by the London Group from its earliest days. We could then cross-reference with the press and see which works were engendering the most column inches, column inches, whether critical or praiseworthy. And I think what was particularly interesting to our eyes today was that there were many names that came up that we actually didn't recognise today, um, artists who were less well-known, and in certain cases we've included particularly amongst the women artists, some whose reputations are much less well known today, but you can see from the calibre of the work by artists like Eileen Agar, Edna Manley, um, Jessica Gertrude, Dismore. Jessica Dismore, Gertrude Hermes, that these were women who were really making waves at the time. And we were delighted also on the back of that we could include founder women members. There were several things about the London group which really attracted us to um, the exhibition itself and things that we could explore, such as the fact that women were um, allowed to be founder members and indeed members in their own right, having been banned, of course, from the Camden Town Group previously on account of their sex. So we were able to have both founder women members like Ethel Sands, um, who again is less well known today, but of course also an important patroness of the arts, um, and some of the much more modern names that Rachel mentioned um, who bring the story more up to date. Including I suppose someone like Dorothy Mead who was the first London Group female president in the early 70s who's really completely disappeared off the radar. Though having said that she has been re-researched uh, by London South Bank University who have a strong connection obviously with the Borough Group and so her reputation is now uh, being re-examined and it's amazing when you think she did not have a solo show in her lifetime so it has taken all this passage of time um, to recognize her talents. Um, we also keyed into obviously the Anglo-Jewish artists because that's where the London group and Ben Uri um, have a clear synergy particularly in the founding years. Ben Uri was founded in 1915 so only two years after the London group and when Sarah and I were approached to do the exhibition, our immediate reaction was the London group are, that is artists like David Bomber, Jacob Epstein, Jacob Kramer, Mark Gertler, Bernard Meninsky, all members of the Whitechapel Boys grouping and all represented in Ben Uri. So we knew there was going to be this fit to start with, but we didn't really know how the rest of the decades were going to pan out and it has been an absolute revelation to find I think particularly mainstream artists who exhibited with the London group such as Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth who perhaps chose not to recognize this part of their exhibition history later on when they became so successful it wasn't necessary 
to their promotion. So there are all sorts of artists included, uh, you know, real household names, figures like Lowry, who may have only dipped into the London group for a year or two, or there are other artists who exhibited with the London group for you know, virtually every year of their professional career. I think that also throws up a, a couple of other interesting points. One is that, again, like the women, we were very keen to explore um, the contribution that was made by sculptors in particular. Um, Henri Gaudier-Brezhka and Jacob Epstein were founder members, and they set a high calibre for the scul sculpture contribution. But when they were taken up by the war, Gaudi, of course, was killed. Um, Epstein reacted in various ways. There was a hi hiatus for a while before the next tranche of sculptors were brought in, headed by the management of Rupert Lee. Um, but there were also several other aspects that we could explore um, in the exhibition, which were the way that these different artist groups um, came together. So, for example, I think we referred already to Camden Town Group. All those members, of course, were automatically absorbed um, into the group. Uh, and then people like Spencer Gore, um, who were of such a great artistic personality that they could bring in members who had, if you like, conflicting artistic um, objectives to themselves and styles, um, but of course made such a, a good pairing when brought together under the umbrella by Gore. Um, however, critics did notice from the start that there were these two very different types of groups um, and that they said they did not agree well with each other. So this was a wonderful opportunity for us to explore those disruptions, those uproars, uh, but also where the good pairings worked out, such as um, we have a couple of husband and wife teams, don't we? We have Bevan and Karlovska. We have a number of presidents. Yes, indeed. Um, also Kenneth and Mary Martin, lots of presidents, as you say. And there were lots of relationships between teachers and pupils, either that direct, comes across very strongly. Um, such as... Um, bomber, Sickert, bomb uh, being taught by Sickert. Going Lots of us, of course, being influenced by Sickert. We have um, Coldstream and Rogers, and then, of course, they influence Hublot. Um, we have Bomberg also affecting Dorothy Mead, as you said, I think, and, and Leon Kossoff. Um, so there were many things to explore, and we really felt that in the selection of artists that we chose, we were able to explore these many subjects. And of course we felt we could have chosen another 50 artists. I know some people have regretted that perhaps their favourite artist or an artist who they feel is very important is not included. I and we could, we could have easily to, um, selected another, yeah, another 50 versions of a London group show. But there were also practical uh, issues, and this is always something you face when you're curating. Um, first of all, we were able to take two works from our own collection, but we didn't want to make the exhibition overly reliant on Benoit. So we have two key works. We have a Kossoff and a Bomberg. Then, of course, you look to institutions to lend works, and you may have particular ideas of your prime works that you'd like to borrow. Of course, until you inquire and make a loan request, you don't know whether those works are then going to be available. And then if a particular work becomes unavailable, that affects the slant of the narrative that you're hoping to tell, and you then have to adjust. Yeah. So I think the final 50 is very different from the original 50 we started from, but that's not to say the final 50 isn't as strong or perhaps even stronger than the initial conception. I also think because we learnt as we went along and uncovered more gems, more interesting anecdotes, more press uh, commentary, and I think the, the final whole sits together as, as a really strong group of works. And we were also very keen to show um, the key artistic movements of each decade. So from Camden Town we had um, sort of less specific artists um, such as Gertler and Co who worked in their own way absorbing lessons but not belonging to a particular group. We had the vorticists and so on. And then in succeeding decades, we looked at things like Bloomsbury, contribution of English surrealism, 
figuration versus abstraction, the many different forms of abstraction, and then some of the individual artists that Rachel's already mentioned, such as Lowry and so on. Then going forward into the 50s, the so-called kitchen sink school and the so-called geometry of film, <coughs> sculptors and so on. So it was this sort of wonderful journey both through the history of British modernism and the many debates it engendered as it was introduced and discussed both in the press and amongst the artists themselves. 